Hi class, um, so welcome to our first remote lecture uh, from my apartment here in Harlem. Hopefully the heater doesn't kick on because you'll hear a hissing noise, but you'll still be able to hear me uh, pretty well. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to do it just like class. I'm going to go through the PowerPoint that I prepare for you. Um, there won't be as many, there will obviously won't be as many questions or asides or, or conversation. Um, but you'll be doing that a little bit in your response, which I'm going to which I'm going to post week to week with these lectures. So it's going to be me going through the, the PowerPoint. Uh, I'm going to use my cursor here um, to point anything out, and uh, I'm going to try to shoot for I don't know about half an hour, 40 minutes, 45 minutes per section. Uh, so we'll have one video with one section. Um, so today is Gothic French architecture. Then I'll make another video with Gothic Italy, so that'll basically be our whole class, right? Um, and it'll add up to, I don't know, maybe about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, maybe an hour and a half, depending on the, on, on the, the topic for that week. Um, so I don't want to go too long because I'm keeping in mind that you're also going to be working on your responses for the attendance, um, which should take you another, you know, maybe 45 minutes to an hour or something like that. Um, I mean, not even that long, but that's that should be a good way to, to go about it um, from week to week to week. So this is our last lecture before the midterm next week, which will be a take home and I'll post to the website. So let's go ahead and, and, and start. We're going to be in France um, for the first part of, of the Gothic period, which comes after the Romanesque, which we which we talked about before our uh, before the college pause. Um, and so we want to start like we do, like, like we often do with the term itself. So the term Gothic, I think you probably have heard this term before. Uh, it has a really interesting history uh, as, as a word. So if you think of Gothic today, I think you probably think of darkness, uh, emo, black fingernails, black metal, um, you know, sort of dark, macabre, um, maybe even sinister um, associations with the word with the word gothic or goth, right? And so you might think of um, it's fun to do a little bit of music history. You might think of um, Black Sabbath, that first Black Sabbath you're seeing, that first Black Sabbath record you're seeing on the right is a classic, total classic. The whole history, uh, the subgenre of of uh, certain forms of metal, especially black metal, can trace itself all the way back to this record. Um, if you like that sort of thing, it's definitely a record you want to know. Um, or the more emo version of goth, gothic, you can trace it back maybe to something like The Cure, uh, Disintegration. It's a fantastic record. Hopefully nobody ever has a bad breakup in their lives, but if you do, this is the record you want to listen to to get you through it. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful record. Um, that one's from, uh, from the 80s. So th this is sort of our, our understanding of the word Gothic as we know it um, today. But it's not quite, it's not actually at all what the word Gothic means in the time period we're studying for the, from like say the 12th to 14th centuries in Europe, like the Gothic period itself. Um, this version, our sort of contemporary um, understanding of the word Gothic comes from the 19th century. Um, and so it's interesting to trace it back because in the 19th century, you will have the word uh, goth or Gothic as a term of uh, something kind of dark, macabre, maybe part of a horror genre. And this comes from the Victorian Gothic novel. Uh, this is a film still, or the, you know, the Gothic period in the 19th century, mainly in England and in France. Um, and in, in you know in, in Western Europe, and so the still you're seeing here, of course, I think you can probably guess it's uh, the the first the original Frankenstein film, uh, which would have been made in the early uh, earlier part of the 20th century, which is based off of a classic novel, which maybe you read in high school. If you've never read uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, it's definitely a key uh, a, a, a key book to read at some point in in your life. Um, there are some scholars that even make it make arguments that it's a, a, a feminist novel, and in fact, Mary Shelley's mother um, um, 
was was a key early uh, feminist um, in 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 Europe in in London. Um, so Frankenstein is definitely this gothic novel, and it has these dark, sort of brooding, uh, macabre undertones um, or overtones, actually, um, making a dead body become animate um, and working with nature. Um, counter nature and so on and so forth. So these themes come from the the nineteenth century, the Gothic as a as 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 as, as dark, um, and we can then trace this back even further, not yet to our time period of today, but in the sixteenth century, with this guy named Giorgio Vasari, who's usually considered to be like one of the first art historians. He wrote biographies of famous artists, many of which we're going to study today and then in the following weeks. So in the 16th century, he was looking back to the art of the time period we're studying today, and he called it art of the Goths. And here he was referencing, you'll remember, those um, nomadic uh, tribes, quote-unquote the bar barbarians, that came, the pre-Christian tribes of Europe that came uh, and basically took over Western Europe before they were Christianized the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Lombards, the Franks, and so on and so forth. Um, we studied them with the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, a lot of them were, were, were Goths, right? Ostrogoth, Visigoths. So Vasari called that, called, called the, 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 the work that they left behind um, art, of the, art of the Goths, the art that comes before the Renaissance period that Vasari is going to champion so much and that we're going to study after our, our midterm um, and he's not quite right about this um, in, in many ways. Um, he calls it barbaric and monstrous. Uh, but in fact, the, the Gothic time period, what we'll study today, is actually quite innovative. Um, there's an incredible explosion of, of, of technology, of philosophy, of culture, of learning um, in, in Western cities. And so Vasari wasn't quite right. He was biased... Um, because he was so into the art of his time, the Renaissance, that he couldn't then see the art of what is then going to be called the Gothic period, um, that it was itself actually quite beautiful and, um, and innovative. And in fact, now we are, we are into our time period, so the 12th to 14th centuries. In fact, Gothic culture, um, this period, not only is it about technical advancements, innovations, learning, the first university is founded in, in Paris, and you actually start to see um, in Bologna, in, um, in Paris, in other parts of Europe, you're starting to see cities as um, um, like, like economic urban expansion and, and formation of cities um, as the, getting us towards the sort of the modern period, the modern understanding of what a city could be or will be. Um, the Gothic period also privileges light. So this is why it's interesting to trace the term backwards because everything you, you might um, associate with goth or gothic today is dark, like literally dark, right? Um, devoid, devoid of life, of, of light. But in fact, the Gothic period, there's this turn towards light. Light itself is going to play a huge factor in some of the architecture that we look at. And to illustrate this, there's a really wonderful altarpiece um, that shows St. Thomas Aquinas. So there he is in the middle. Um, if you study Introduction to f um, Philosophy, if you have a philosophy class, you'll end up, I'm sure you'll end up um, talking about Thomas Aquinas, probably the most important medieval philosopher of the West. He's working around this period. He writes a, a, a very long, very, very long text called the Summa Theologica. <clears throat> and he's one of the first philosophers that tries to marry um, Aristotle, so one of the key uh, philosophers of, of Greece, of ancient Greece, um, Aristotle, the founder of logic, deductive reason, so on and so forth. Um, he tries to marry Aristotelian philosophy with Christian theology, um, trying to prove the existence of God, um, um, and to talk about important theological questions of the time through Aristotle. So it's the synthesis of, of, of Greek philosophy, Aristotle, and um, Christian theology. And this is now called uh, scholasticism, which is the, the most important would be St. Thomas Aquinas. So weirdly enough, already here, 
you're going to learn that the Renaissance is all about reviving Greek and Roman knowledge. So already with St. Thomas Aquinas, already in some ways in this Gothic period, we're seeing this, this revival. So we're seeing the bubbling forth of what the Renaissance is going to be. And so there's this really wonderful altarpiece, I think it's in Pisa in Italy, um, that shows how important light is in the Gothic period. So at the top here you have like this seated enthroned figure of, of the Christian, um, um, of, of, of Christ. And you'll notice there are rays of light that are emanating from his mouth. So the word um, becomes light. So the word of God for Christians, uh, Logos in the beginning of St. John, uh, the Gospel of St. John. Um, it's being visualized here as beams of golden light, rays of light. And, and this light is going from his mouth to these important figures. Many of these you'll know. Um, here we have Moses, and then we have the four evangelists. Uh, we have Paul here. So remember the four evangelists, they always come with their, um, with their avatars, different, different animals. Um, and they, the light is coming into, um, you'll notice it's going into um, uh, their heads and then emanating out their books, their works, right? And they're going into uh, the Summa Theologica of, um, of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. So knowledge, um, d uh, godliness, divinity, holiness, it's being, uh, it's being communicated almost through this network of light. And then you can add on to that, here we have Aristotle, we have Plato, their works, they're beaming light into the head of St. Thomas Aquinas, so you have this fusion of classical knowledge. And then from St. Thomas Aquinas himself and his Summa Theological, the light is going down and, and hitting the heads of contemporary uh, people living in, in, the Gothic, in the Gothic period. Then we have one guy who's not receiving rays of light in his head. Um, this is an Arabic philosopher. His name was Averos. His book is actually being thrown to the ground, upside down, face down by the light. Um, this is because Averos had the temerity to say that um, we could figure out things, we could figure out truths through observation on our own. We wouldn't need, uh, we wouldn't nece necessarily need divine intervention to understand the truth. Um, so he's a really important thinker, um, way ahead of the curve here um, in, in many ways. But all this to, to show you that um, light plays an incredibly important uh, role uh, in the Gothic period. And in this altarpiece, it actually becomes the, the word of God for Christians that becomes this, this, this network, this form of communicating and fusing knowledge. So it's a nice work to look at as an introduction. But of course, we're going we're gonna to focus most on architecture in this class uh, because in, in France, but this was an international style. You have, if you go visit Europe today, um, which I hope many of you will in your lifetime, uh, you're going you're gonna to see all sorts of incredible cathedrals. And some of the biggest, some of the most astonishing are the, are the, are the ones that come from the Gothic period. Um, and this has to do with this new learning. Um, it has to do with these new innovations. And it has to do with, with, the, with the time period and, and above all, in, in, in architecturally, visually, aesthetically, the privileging of light, uh, which, is, which is made, um, which is allowed to come into these churches through these technical advancements. So usually the first Gothic uh, structure, the one that's fully fledged as Gothic, is the Saint-Denis Church, uh, just outside of Paris. It's in France. And it was overseen by this name, this, this um, abbot. His name was Abbot Suger, uh, who was very, very important. We'll talk about him a couple more times during, the, during this lecture. But this is the ambulatory and radiating chapels um, where you could walk walk around in this in this church radiating it's your, your your ambulatory radiating chapel you're you're walking around and you'll notice already uh, we have these columns and we have these arches and this is one of the first arch um, um, buildings that we see that uses this new these new architectural uh, refinements 
and these new and these new arches, which are called Gothic arches, right, um, or pointed arches. So in the Gothic period, one of the one of the key innovations is we're moving away from the the Roman arch, which was used throughout the Romanesque that you'll remember from last class, and we're moving towards the pointed Gothic arch. And then of course these can be com uh, combined to make groin vaults or barrel vaults, right? You put two together. Uh, perpendicular to each other and then you create a groin vault or a barrel vault and so this would be the Romanesque version the Roman version and now this would be the the, 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 the Gothic version right and so there are a few things that are really um, important about the transition to the Gothic arch so for one thing you'll notice um, for those of you who are engineering minded um, when 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 we're talking about um, the pole on the buildings, like the the the, the load bearing of of of, bear, of, of buildings, right? Um, in the, the the Roman arch, in the Romanesque arch, the gravity it's pulling down straight down um, on top of this, which means it's pulling to the sides. So the weight it's 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 you have a lot of weight here on the top, which means the the columns here, um, the walls on the sides that that are, that are housing the the arches, they're going to be pushing outwards, right? And so you're going to need a lot of thick masonry. You're going to need a lot of um, um, re reinforcement to keep this arch up, especially the bigger you make it. Right, so this is a downside to the to the to the Roman arch, is that you really need thick foundations um, to keep it up, which is why those Romanesque churches and cathedrals we saw um, 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 a few weeks back now, which is why they were they were so monolithic, almost fortress-like. Right, they're really heavy and grounded. Right. Well, if you move to the Gothic arch, now all of a sudden you'll notice that the gravity it's pulling down, but because it's pointed up. It, um, you have less load bearing in the middle and it's it's going actually more straight down into the column so there's less of an outward thrust and this has a lot of advantages because this means that you need less reinforcement right and you can build bigger and bigger and bigger so it's because of this is one of the big reasons why gothic churches are bigger and why the walls can be thinner um, which allows for stained glass windows, which you're going to see is one of like the most incredible parts of these of these structures. It's because of this um, Gothic um, point, which seems like a minor variation, uh, but because of gravity, because of the load bearing technology, it's actually pretty revolutionary. The other thing that's revolutionary is that uh, with a, a Roman arch, you can basically only um, prescribe like one distance from wall to wall, right? If you if you if if you're gonna want it to to, to to traverse this distance, basically you need this arch, right? And if you want to make it bigger, you have to make this arch bigger and bigger and bigger. With the Gothic arch, notice that because of the middle part, it can swivel, right? So it can get more narrow or wider, which means it could get higher. There's just much more. Uh, flexibility it can traverse more there's just much more flexibility with um, with the gothic arch so that's really important to keep in mind and I would look at the book um, and read up a bit more about um, the, the gothic arch and why it's so important why it's such a revolution in, in architecture and so when, when we talk about gothic architecture we're gonna we're gonna focus on one building um, specifically and it's not going to be this one, but I did want to show this one to you because it's probably the most famous. This is the Notre Dame in Paris, and you'll remember last year it actually had a, a terrible, a terrible fire, um, and it just barely, barely survived. Um, and so Notre Dame in, in Paris is a key, um, a key cathedral, like a very, very key, key, key cathedral, and it's actually quite sad that so much of it um, has been destroyed. Mm. But it's not the only Notre Dame. Um, in fact, there are a lot of Notre Dame. Notre Dame just means Our Lady, and of course, for Christians, for Catholics, Our Lady um, is the is the Virgin Mary. So all of these churches that are Notre Dame, Our Lady, that just means that they've been um, um, dedicated to the the Virgin Mary, right? That's what the, the 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 structure is all about. And please keep that in mind 
as we're looking at these. And so the other very famous Notre Dame is the one in Chartres in France. So this is further south from, from Paris. Um, and it's a pretty incredible cathedral. This is, you know, not a modern day shot, but this isn't too long ago, right? This is, this is in the 20th century, probably this photograph, later 20th century. And you can tell already that this, that the, 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 the Gothic cathedral, it's so massive that it even still dominates the landscape today. It would be the central focal point um, for these, these emerging Gothic cities, right? Um, it was begun in 1135. Then there was a terrible fire. Um, this would happen a lot back then. Um, and, and the original structure, a lot of it was destroyed. And then it would be rebuilt after um, 1194. And it's one of the first cathedrals to use all these new innovations that we now come to define as, um, as Gothic. And so here it is from, the, from a, a bird's eye view, basically, a helicopter view. And so you'll notice, what's the shape? It's a, it's a cross shape, right? And I'm always fascinated by this because for us today, this is no big deal, right? We have topographic views all the time. I mean, like you can go on Google Maps and look at anything in the world now from a bird's eye view, right? Um, from a satellite view, we would probably say. Uh, but back then in 1135, if you think about it, this was an impossible vantage point, right? There weren't even hot air balloons. There, there, there was no way that any human being, not even the architects who designed this, we don't know who they are, but not even the architects who designed this could have seen this from this vantage point. And that might seem like a minor point until you think about it, that they've made it into a cross, which means for them, the only person that can actually see the cross itself, that can see the structure from the top, for them would be God, right? So weirdly enough, our view of this, for them, would have been this impossible God's eye view that they couldn't even have fathomed, right? Um, so I find that kind of cool, um, that they make this structure, make it into a cross shape, um, which actually goes back to Roman uh, basilica, Roman architecture. Um, so symbolically, it could only be for um, the, 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 the Christian God to see. So it's kind of a cool, a cool little, little note. Um, you'll also notice, so when we go inside, you're going to see how the Gothic arch is used. Um, you're going to see how this gets taller and taller and taller as a structure, and the walls get thinner and thinner and thinner which allows the architects to introduce all these incredible stained glass windows. One of the reasons for this is, yes, the Gothic arch, but another are, you see these like um, rib, like uh, this, I, almost, I almost think it's like an exoskeleton or something like that, these ribs that are coming out um, and basically latching on to the building. These are another key feature of Gothic architecture. These are called flying buttresses. And so think of them as masonry, like these arms that are coming out and holding up the wall. So they don't get in the way of the negative space of the windows, uh, but they do supply extra load-bearing um, integrity so that, again, you can build higher and higher and higher, and you can build thinner and thinner and thinner um, so that you can include all these incredible um, all these incredible um, uh, stained glass windows. There's a really famous art historian, his name was Gombrich. He basically called these, these cathedral greenhouses for God. Um, so think of a greenhouse as a structure that lets light in, that's made of glass. Um, that's what these cathedrals were like, shooting up in, into space. Um, and so if you go in, this is the best part. I can tell you having... Um, um, been to France, but I was raised in France. Um, one of the one of the one of the great things to do um, um, if if you're into architecture is to walk into these cathedrals because it's this huge, incredible space. You're sort of f flooded with light. There's this really wonderful atmosphere, um, and it's I mean it's just really really impressive. You can get an approximation of this. Um, once we can all leave our homes again uh, by going to St. John's, not far from City College. So St. John's right by uh, Columbia, right right in front of the, um, the Hungarian pastry shop on, on, on Amsterdam. That's a pretty sizable um, um, church, 
cathedral here in New York City and you walk in, you'll get a similar feel. So it's very, very high, very tall. And you notice this is the vaulting, right? These are the Gothic. These are all barrel vaults. This is the vaulting, right? Um, and sometimes, again, it looks almost like vertebrae, like this is the spine and these are like ribs. Um, this is what allows these structures to be so high and, and so impressive. And all along the top here, these are all stained glass windows. And you have an organ, um, you'll often have music, you'll have incense. There's, there's, it's, it's quite an atmosphere. Um, it's an architectural feat, it really is. Um, and so this is, this is Chartres, right? This is Chartres Cathedral, Notre Dame in Chartres. There's one part of it, um, the western facade, the royal portal, it's quite famous. This is the only part of the original cathedral, the one that, that was destroyed in the fire, um, to remain. And what they did, instead of destroying it and starting from scratch, they integrated it into the new cathedral. Right? And just like the Romanesque, you'll remember in the Romanesque we looked at that, that portal, we have doors, the portals themselves, and then we have tympanums with sculpture. And so we can go through these uh, because the Gothic, uh, Gothic architecture is teeming with, with architectural elements. So on the sides here, these are called door jams. Um, you have Old Testament kings, so kings within the Old Testament, uh, within the Old Testament that will prefigure the, um, the stories in the New Testament, right? So these are Old Testament kings, and they would often double as French kings, which is why during the French Revolution, which we'll talk about in a few weeks, which is why some of these were destroyed by French revolutionaries who were trying to overthrow the monarchy. So they're literally, if these are Old Testament kings prefiguring the New Testament, they're literally holding up the stories that are on top. Right, which we're going to which we're going to go to next, which is stories from the New Testament. Right, so the prefiguration here is encoded visually, um, which is which is kind of neat. And so you have this whole narrative frieze, recounting the story of um, the Virgin Mary and Christ um, in the New Testament. So I don't have really great high resolutions of these. Just know that this is a frieze, um, giving us stories from the uh, um, Virgin Mary and Christ. What's of interest for us, I think most, is are the, the three tympanums, right? And this is, this is still debated. Scholars still debate this today um, as to what these three tympanums mean. Um, so I'm going to give you the interpretation that, that I like from a, a pretty well-known um, um, Gothic scholar. His name's uh, Camille. On this tympanum, you have an image of Christ next to a couple angels. Um, and this is, the guess is, Christ before the Incarnation. So Christ before um, the Immaculate Conception, right? Before um, he becomes um, um, flesh, right, for Christians. So that would be a time past. That would be the time before for Christians, the time before the Messiah becoming, taking on human form, right? Um, so according to this reading, these tympanums have to do with temporality. So this one is about the past, Christ before the Incarnation. Then this, is, this one will then be about the present. So we have the Virgin Mary, we have the Christ Child, again flanked by, by, by angels and other stories. Um, and then this would then be the present, the moment for Christians of grace where their God comes and is born and will die for their sins, right? For original sin and for redemption. So this is the, the present moment for Christians, right? This is the moment that Christians are living in. And then, of course, they're waiting the future, um, the last judgment where the Messiah will return um, and will, will judge. And so here we have a large enthroned Christ like we saw in the Romanesque. And then we also have the four evangelists, the, the, the four writers of the Gospels uh, the, the, in, the New, in the New Testament that tells of the, 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 the stories and life of Christ. Um, we have Matthew who's always with an angel, a winged man. We have Mark who always, his avatar is the winged, is a lion. We have Luke whose avatar is the ox and then John 
is the the eagle right so you'll see here is matthew um here is john the eagle here is the ox so this would be luke um and here is the lion which would be mark and they all have wings so they're all angelic um, so these animals are not simply winged animals right they're they're they 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 signify these important um points of scripture for for christians right so, so the, the thing to note about this, uh, this, this, this tympanum and the whole portal, actually the whole royal portal, is that it's very different from the Romanesque. You'll remember the Romanesque was all about hellfire and brimstone and damnation and judgment. Um, the Gothic period is much more about r redemption. Um, and you, you're not even seeing hell, you're not seeing demons, you're not seeing um, damnation so much. You're actually seeing affirmative figures, and you all, you're, a lot of times you'll see the, the Virgin Mary, right, which we saw in the, the, the tympanum on the right. And she signifies, for Christians, grace, right, salvation, um, and the carrier of, of, um, of God himself. And this is important because we can make an analogy between her and these Gothic, Gothic cathedrals, as we will in, in a moment. So the other key feature of Schacht and a lot of these Gothic cathedrals are the rose windows. Um, here it is from the outside, which looks a little bit drab. It's not that spectacular, but when you walk in, you, you, you notice that the, lice, the, 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 the light comes in and creates these beautiful effects. Um, so here it is from further... Uh, um, up close a little bit further this is the rose window and lancets so this is the rose window which is named the rose window because it looks like a flower and then these are the lancets down here right um lancets which look like these gothic um almost like these gothic um, um spires here right and so in this one you have anne and the virgin mary as a as a baby um, anne is the mother of of mary um, you have, uh, again, Old Testament kings on, on, the, on the, uh, flanking them. In the rose window itself, you'll have other um, Old Testament kings, other religious figures. You'll have um, four doves here, which usually will denote the Holy Spirit, so part of the Trinity for, um, for Christians. And in the very center, which makes sense since this structure is dedicated to the Virgin Mary, you'll have the Virgin Mary with Christ's child, right, in, in, in the center. Um, and so when you walk in, this rose window feels like, um, especially during the, depending on the time of day, it's emanating this ambient light, and it's really quite, um, quite beautiful. And so you'll remember that scene I showed you from the name of the rose, um, how the Romanesque was all about darkness. Um, it was even hard to make things out. The Gothic period is quite different. Um, it's luminous. Uh, there's an emphasis on light, and there's an emphasis on lightness um, of these these windows that seem to just kind of be hovering there in the air. And this is where we get back to Abbot Suger, um, who developed a theory of lux nova, or what, that's Latin for new light. And we have writings by Abbot Suger, where we know what he thought of light uh, and what happens to light once it enters. Um, a religious structure like a cathedral. And so he says, It seems to me I see myself dwelling, as it were, in some strange region of the universe, which neither exists entirely in the slime of the earth, nor entirely in the purity of heaven. So what this quote means is that when you're in a church, when a Christian, or when Abbot Suger is in this church, and he's bathed in this light, he's no longer in the slime of the earth, He's no longer in the mundane outside world, um, nor, of course, is he yet in heaven, right? But the church is some holy way station. It's like this midpoint between these new places, made, made only possible by God and by this architecture, right? So for Lux Nova, this theory of new light, for Suger, once the light hits the, the stained glass and comes into the cathedral, it's no longer normal everyday sunlight it, it becomes holy light it becomes transubstantiated so in the same way that for catholics once bread and wine 
are transubstantiated through the sacrament of the Eucharist, it becomes, it really does become blood and body, right? It really does become flesh and blood of Christ for, for, for Catholics, right? It's the same thing with light. Light comes in through these stained glass windows, and then it becomes holy. It becomes, it becomes divine. Um, and it's as if the faithful sort of get a, ta a, a taste. They get a respite from their everyday world, the slimy world, and they get a taste of a, whole, uh, a heavenly divine world. Right? So this architecture is, is really symbolically rich uh, and, and meaningful. And so I can show you one other cathedral. Um, we don't have to just stay with Chartres. Here is the cathedral in Reims, which is more north um, in, in France. And you're seeing it here from the front, so all these features you, you will, will have already talked about right here, right? So you have the portal, you'll have the tympanums, and notice here now the tympanum is no longer sculpture, but it's made of glass. This is a later version of Gothic architecture. Um, you have sculpture sculptures throughout the facade of the architecture. And then you'll, you'll also notice on the top, uh, the two towers, the two the the, the 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 two towers on top of the cathedral here. You're seeing it from the from the front. Um, if you saw it from the side, it would look similar to shop. But notice that the spires were never finished, and this was actually common. So it would take a long time to build these things. Um, a lot of labor, anonymous laboring people, and it would take a lot of money, and sometimes. Uh, a lot of money that came from tributes, from taxation, right? And a lot of times the money would simply run out and the, 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 the structure wouldn't be completely finished. So this is the case with glass. This is why the two towers don't have spires um, on the top. And at last we come to Gothic statuary and some quite well-known um, uh, jam statues. So you remember when you have uh, statues that are part of the... the uh, the door or the, the, the portal or, or, or the, the facade of the cathedral, they'll be called jam statues, J-A-M-B. And these are two very famous um, groups of jam statues. Um, so here we have in one Gothic style, which is much more stylized, we have Arch, Arch, uh, Arch um, Angel Gabriel, and he's looking to Mary. And so this is an Annunciation scene. We're going to talk a lot about Annunciation scenes, especially when we get to the Renaissance, because it's a very popular theme uh, for Christian visual culture during, during that period. But essentially, the, the Annunciation is the moment where the Virgin Mary, um, for, for Christians, is told that she's going to bear the Christ child. And in fact, in some depictions, she'll actually, you, you will have the Immaculate Conception happening um, as it's being announced, right? We'll see this in a couple weeks with early Renaissance. So this is Archangel Gabriel and Mary. And so notice the architectural, uh, the sculptural style here. The, the clothing um, is pretty naturalistic. You'd almost say this is Greco-Roman in some way stylistically, but the human figure itself is quite stylized. It doesn't look quite real. It's not naturalistic. Um, of course, you have the, the, the wing, right? Um, so the, the, the Archangel Gabriel and the Virgin Mary, they're done slightly differently, um, but there's something much more stylized and symbolic about the way they're represented. They don't look like actual um, human beings. This changes when we move to the, the statuary on, on the right here. Um, this is Mary again, okay? And then this is Elizabeth. And this is called the Visitation. So the Visitation is, is a story of uh, Mary, who now already has, uh, you've already had the Immaculate Conception. She's with Christ's child. Um, she meets Elizabeth who's her uh, cousin, um, who is also pregnant. She's pregnant with St. John the Baptist, and St. John the Baptist will baptize Christ uh, in the Jordan River. Um, so here you, you, you're almost like, there, there, are two, there are four people meeting. You have Elizabeth and St. John the Baptist meeting Mary and um, the Christ child 
for the first time. Um, and this is the first moment where someone else other than Mary knows that um, she's going to conceive God, basically, um, for Christians. And so Elizabeth is the first to know. That, and this is called the, the visitation. So that's the story, but maybe most interesting for us is the style, the change in style here. Notice the, the drapery uh, and the bodies. Now we really are um, getting back to something that looks like Greco-Roman statue. Very naturalistic. Elizabeth looks like an older woman, right? She looks like um, someone who who's, could actually have been alive at that time. Um, and same thing with Mary. I mean, Mary is, is idealized. Um, um, she doesn't look like she would be, you know, someone from off the street. Uh, but nonetheless, she does look like an idealized human being, right? She doesn't look as stylized as Mary here, certainly not as stylized as Archangel Gabriel, right? So in the later Gothic here, we're, mo we're already moving towards a type of naturalism, even uh, a naturalism depicting religious figures. Remember, a lot of the, the um, Christian visual culture that we've studied de-emphasizes the body. The body is something um, unimportant, maybe even sinful uh, or lustful, right? Here, the body is coming back in its fullness, in the same way that we saw it with ancient statuary. So once again, if we talked at the beginning of this lecture, if we talked about St. Thomas Aquinas as marrying ancient knowledge, Aristotle, with Christian theology, we're seeing that here too with the visitation, with Elizabeth and Mary, key religious figures for Christians, but now depicted to us in very naturalistic ways. Uh, terms. So this is already pointing us towards the, the Renaissance, right, which is this key moment of the marriage, the resuscitation of ancient knowledge, ancient visual culture, um, and um, Christian iconography and Christian culture. That's also going to be, case, the, be the case in the next lecture, in the next part of today's lecture, where we talk about um, Giotto and, and Gothic Italian painting. We're going to have those similar features. So why don't you um, take a break, um, and then once you're ready, go to the next lecture, um, which I'm going to record next, Gothic Italian painting.